Hi guys, my name is Chris and my project was I'm looking into using hydrogen as a grid scale energy storage medium. The aim of this report was to determine if hydrogen could be economically viable as storage for off-peak grid energy or for underutilized renewable energy. In this presentation, I'll be walking you through the background of why I'm doing this project, what factors are contributing towards the need for more storage, and what technology is currently available. I'll then discuss why I made the system the way it is and what parameters have the biggest influence over its viability. Finally, I will show you the real life application with a case study and wrap up the final results. The scope of this project does not delve deeply into the technical issues such as leak prevention or hydrogen embrittlement of steels. Instead, it is looking at the efficiencies of current technology, their operating costs and their capital costs. Currently, most of our energy generation is from fossil fuel sources such as coal, petrol, etc. These are more popular due to their transportability, availability, and energy content under standard conditions. Consumption of these fuels produces greenhouse gases, which are harmful to the environment. We want to move away from our dependence on fossil fuels by sourcing and storing energy from carbon neutral sources. So why should we, why should we be looking into large scale energy storage? Moving to reliance on renewables comes with a few complications. Australia has an abundance of untapped solar and wind energy, which may even remove the need for fossil fuels completely if enough solar panels and wind turbines are installed. However, unlike fossil fuels, these renewable technologies are not available on demand and all the time. We therefore need to store some of this energy for when it is not available. The next problem is the supply and demand. If the potential for electricity generation is there, but there's no load to service it, then it is simply just not generated. Also, if the availability matched the supply better, then less storage would be required. But because this isn't the case, a significant amount of storage is required, required to basically shift the supply curve to meet the demand curve. The energy that is not being demanded at that time of the day can then be stored for later use. The key parameter for the best storage is its round trip efficiency or how much energy is lost between charging and discharging. Australia currently has some grid scale storage. Conventional electrochemical battery storage is used in the newly installed 129 megawatt hour lithium ion battery in the Hornsdale Power Reserve in South Australia. Also, the Snowy Hydro Scheme uses water pump to higher elevations during off-peak power times to then drive a turbine when the demand is higher. The natural gas network is another large scale storage, however this does not charge and discharge, discharge like a conventional battery. Instead, the stored chemical energy in the gas can be used to power gas turbines to produce energy. This could be decarbonized by the injection of hydrogen into the network. So why not just use a big battery instead of gas? Lithium ion batteries are the most commonly used conventional battery and are available at the megawatt scale. These however require significant amounts of lithium to be mined, and when they reach the end of their working life, disposal becomes an environmental issue. Batteries are also mainly for short-term storage, as the ions return to equilibrium after an amount of time, whereas hydrogen should not theoretically deplete, unless of course there is a leak. Increasing the battery capacity requires more and more lithium, whereas hydrogen's capacity is based on the size and pressure of the container that it's stored in. The energy properties of hydrogen also make it an attractive energy storage medium. It has the highest energy content by mass, but due to its extremely low density, it requires significant compression or liquefaction to compete with other common fuels by volume. This compression can use up to 10% of the total energy of the gas. This is more important for portable applications than grid scale, as storage space is not as restri restricted, especially as Australia has vast open land. Next, I had to put together a system to run some calculations. Developing an intricate model of each phase of the system would lead to far too many variables and assumptions that would take away from the validity of the model. Instead, parameters of interest were sourced from existing technology. This will also make it more realistic for examining the possibilities for current day implementation and help determine what progress needs to be made in which areas. The system was implemented as seen in this slide. It was assumed that the compression and expansion processes would be isothermal and that the AC-DC transformation losses would be neglected. In reality, there would be some minor losses in these areas. The economic life was assumed to be 20 years, which is what the total yield will be calculated using. Also, maintenance costs have been neglected besides the consideration of an electrolyzer stack replacement. If it turns out that this is economically viable, then these factors that have been left out should then be included to give a more accurate result. The main factor determining the viability is the levelized cost, or how much does it cost from charging to discharging. This is calculated by summing all the costs of actually building and maintaining the system, then dividing by how much hydrogen is expected to be produced over its economic life. The operating costs such as water and electricity are then factored in to calculate the total cost on a mass or energy basis. The heating value of hydrogen is based on whether the consumption method is expected to produce water, in which case use the higher heating value, or as vapor, then use the lower heating value. The difference between these being the energy required to convert the water to steam. As gas is sold on the basis of higher heating value, this is what will be used in the calculations given by the HHV in the equation on the slide. 
Hydrogen is also used in industrial processes, such as ammonia synthesis for fertilizers. This hydrogen is currently produced by a process known as steam reforming, where steam under high temperature and pressure is reacted with a hydrocarbon, most commonly methane, to separate the hydrogen from the carbon atoms. The leftover carbon then joins with the oxygen to produce carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, which are both harmful to the environment. A more environmentally friendly method of hydrogen production is electrolysis. This is the same principle as experiments you may have done when you were younger, by placing two pieces of metal to act as electrodes into a salt solution and connecting a DC current source across them. Oxygen gas is formed at one side while hydrogen gas at the other. This is known as alkaline electrolysis. Another method, which is the one that will be used in this analysis, is PEM electrolysis, shown in, uh, shown in the slide here. A catalyst generally made of platinum alloy is used to separate the water into hydrogen and oxygen. A membrane that only allows positive ions to cross is then used to remove the hydrogen from the oxygen, and the hydrogen ions then recombine with their electrons to form hydrogen gas. The electrolyzer model used in this analysis is the Siemens Silizer 300, with the operational and capital cost data provided by a representative of Siemens. As mentioned previously, the hydrogen requires significant compression for economic storage. At higher pressures, the ideal gas law tends to move away from the actual behavior due to the compressibility of the gas. This relates to the size of the gas molecules becoming significant enough to impact the volume they're contained in, as well as the attraction forces of the molecules as they come closer together. As I will be looking at higher pressures, the virial equation of state will be used as this accounts for the, this compressibility and is more conservative than using the van der Waals equation, as shown in the graph on the slide. A reciprocating compressor has been chosen for the capital cost calculations, as these can operate close to isothermal con conditions with interstage cooling. The three options I looked at for storage solutions were using an underground cabin like what is used, currently used for natural gas, using an array of pipes, or using above ground spherical vessels. The cabin solution was too geographically constricted and it is likely that the hydrogen would become polluted from leftover natural gas. The spherical vessels were assumed to cost significantly more than piping due to their complex shapes and therefore piping was chosen. This also has the benefit of being able to be buried underground, which creates natural insulation and increases the allowable operating pressure. The problem with using steel is the chance of hydrogen embrittlement, and therefore the pipes would require a special coating. This has been accounted for in the construction cost of the pipes. One method for turning the gas back to electricity is using a fuel cell, which basically operates as an electrolyzer in reverse. The hydrogen gas is separated on a catalyst and the ions pass through the membrane, while the electrons travel through an external circuit producing useful work. The ions and electrons then join up with the oxygen at the cathode, with the only byproduct of this process being water. CapEx for this is based on the similarity to the electrolyzer in the way of the materials and operation. The other option is using a gas turbine, similar to what is used for natural gas. The combustion process does still produce nitrous oxide emissions due to the nitrogen reacting with the oxygen in the air. There are issues with substituting in hydrogen as the fuel, such as the concern of flame speed sucking the flame back into the burner and causing damage. Siemens, however, currently have three aeroderivative models that can run solely on hydrogen. As this technology is not currently available using what is called dry low emissions technology, additional water is required to minimize these emissions using what is known as wet low emissions technology. Capital cost was again provided by the Siemens representative. The next thing we need to know is how often and when prices are high and low. The low prices determine how often energy can be bought, while the high prices determine the window of opportunity for profit to be made. Both of these periods are required to determine the required size of the discharge equipment based on how much hydrogen has been produced and is available for discharge, and also how quickly it has to be discharged. All these parameters then need to be pulled together to form the basis of a system. The sensitivity analysis is used to determine which parameters have the most influence over the cost by varying one at a time to their upper and lower limits. The subsystems from the previous slides were used to determine the assumed conditions of a base case as shown in the table, which were then applied to the levelized cost equations. The consumption assumes four hours per day for discharge, with the cost and size of consumption equipment dependent on the available hydrogen, which is then dependent on the electrolyzer runtime. The first case is selling the hydrogen as a gas into the natural gas network. The most influential parameters for this are the electrolyzer efficiency and the cost of electricity. As natural gas is currently selling for around $5 to $10 per gigajoule, it is therefore not a profitable venture using gridboard energy, as it shows here that the cost would be around just over $47 to produce per gigajoule. The next case is converting the gas to electricity using the fuel cell. The most influential factor here is how much hydrogen is actually being converted to useful electricity and not lost as heat. This is followed by electricity cost and electrolyzer energy consumption. The LCOE for this case is around $430 per megawatt hour, 
which there were only a few hours in the whole of 2019 above this price, even if the fuel consumption was reduced by the 30%. The LCOE is still much higher than the majority of the sale prices throughout the year. This is therefore also not currently viable as a profitable business venture. The fuel cell is then substituted for the turbine, which has lower capital costs but also a higher fuel consumption. Again, the most influential factor is the fuel consumption, with similar trends to the fuel cell analysis. The LCOE is slightly higher here and is therefore also not currently viable using grid energy. One way to reduce the cost of electricity required for hydrogen production is to apply this technology where the price is practically zero. A good option for this is using underutilized renewable energy sources, such as the solar farm. The difference in the potential and the actual output of the solar farm is shown here. Now the, no the model is not as accurate as, accurate as it could be, as it does not take into account the position of the sun in the sky at a certain time of the year. This would affect panel exposure as the panels are a 25 degree incline to the north and the sun, is, the sun is higher in the sky in summer and lower in the north in winter. However, it does give a good representation of the difference in available solar energy at different times of the year and the potential to harvest the energy that cannot be directly utilized by the grid. The orange line is sourced from the documented output data from the PV farm by AGL, while the blue line is from the weather data for Ningen from the Bureau of Meteorology. The weather data was converted from megajoules per square meter to megawatt hours by measuring the approximate area covered by the panels and then multiplying by an efficiency factor. The efficiency factor was made by conservatively assuming that no energy was wasted at the lowest irradiation levels in winter, which was at 7% efficiency. These values were on a per day basis, which means it had to be broken down into hourly values as solar exposure is not constant throughout the day. Using a data set of a typical year from the CSIRO, the fraction of total radiation received each hour was calculated and applied to the daily data to give an hourly data output. This modified data can then be used to determine the most effective system size. For example, one stack rated to 18.4 megawatts would be working at a maximum output for 70% of the time and have an input less than the rated power for 30% of the time, as shown in the graph on the right. The system would be underutilized if not at full capacity, which affects yield and therefore the levelized cost. The total energy that would be otherwise wasted is shown in the table for each system size. The total wasted energy is roughly 130 gigawatt hours, with almost half of that reclaimed with just one electrolyzer stack. It is also assumed that any energy less than 40% of the rated input of one stack is not utilized, which ensures that the system has sufficient input to operate. The energy reclaim is then input into the system to determine the annual yield and the levelized cost. The costs and efficiencies used are given in this table. The energetic cost of hydrogen is still slightly more than natural gas, but this could become competitive if more pressure was put on gas producers to decarbonize. The round trip efficiency is also quite low compared to other forms of storage. As mentioned before, the rate of discharge affects the levelized costs as a bigger fuel cell costs more, but can take better advantage of spot prices as it can discharge more energy in a shorter amount of time. The effect of discharge time on price is shown here. This also shows that using one stack has the lowest required resale price. However, the amount of hydrogen stored is lower as it is proportional to the reclaimed photovoltaic energy. The levelized cost and discharge time is then compared to the half hourly spot prices. The potential annual profit is then shown here with a discharge time of two and a half hours reaping the highest profit. Using energy that costs nothing is therefore a potential contender for a hydrogen storage system. The sensitivity analysis also showed the low impact that storage had on the overall cost. Therefore, many days, weeks, or even months of storage could be installed for seasonal usage. From this, I think it can be concluded that storing off-peak energy from the grid is currently not a profitable business venture. The resale cost of the, both the electricity grid and the gas network was significantly lower than the cost of production. This was mostly due to the efficiency of the conversions back to electricity and the cost of operating the electrolyzer. Integrating with renewables, however, is a potentially profitable business venture, especially if the capacity and discharge capacity is increased to make better use of the higher spot prices. I believe hydrogen could be a viable solution for decarbonizing the energy sector. However, this will be require more efficient processes and lower cost materials. Thank you for listening.